2024 approaches. I just found out this morning one of the things I'm thankful for is large print Bibles. <laughs> because I brought uh, my usual Bible, which is like a probably eight and a half, nine font, and I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to stand up and read this unless I hold it in front of my face. So I've been seeing that more and more lately because my eyes are not working like they're, they used to. You know, they hit 42 and those things start happening all the time. So, um, but it is a reminder of God's grace, right? That as our Amen. strength fades, uh, it shows us what we need is Christ. We don't rely on those gifts we have, we rely on Him. Yeah. So I pray we do that uh, in 2024. Uh, this morning we're going to be in Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. Nehemiah 8, verses 1 through 12. And if you are using the Pew Bible, the nice large print like I am, it's on page 474 in that Bible. Again, it's Nehemiah 8, 1 through 12. And this passage really focuses on the centrality of God's word as his people gather together to worship him. And one of the things they do in this passage as God's word is read is they stand. And so I'm going to ask just this morning, because of the passage, if you find that passage, and if you're able to stand, if you stand with me as I do it. And there's some tough names in here. Now I don't have the small print as an excuse to, to mess up these names. So I guess. All right. So Nehemiah 8, we'll read 1 through 12. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And, behind, and beside him stood... Mattathiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Michelle, Melchizedek, Hashem, Hishbadamah, Zechariah, and Meshalom on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalida, Ezariah, Jezebad, Hannah, Peliah, the Levites, helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in those places. They read from the books and the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. And then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. This is the word of God. Let's just pray one more time before we get into this. Um, Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we just ask this morning at the reading of it, at the of it, that you would work in our hearts and help us to see your glory, and that we would be more like Jesus because of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can go ahead and take a seat. We know that the Northwoods economy is heavily driven by tourism, and there are many jobs connected specifically to vacation properties, right? It's everywhere. Uh, there, you, everyone knows people are maybe yourself, either manage a property, you clean it, you do ground for it. It's a huge part of living in this area, right? Um, this surprising story comes not out of the Northwest, but from Las Vegas in a situation like that. According to the September report from a Las Vegas local news outlet, uh, news outlet 8 News Now, 
one property manager decided to take the property she managed into her own hands. Uh, rather than collecting the money and delivering it to the owner of the properties, Chelsea Howard decided that she would just have the tenants pay her directly. She now faces charges of theft, forgery, and unlawful felony. She's accused of stealing more than $100,000 from her employer, and she allegedly even collected money from tenants renting from other companies that her boss, like other properties her boss didn't even own. It's a pretty bold woman. It's hard to imagine such a property manager would get her job back and never work in this field again, right? Um, but just imagine if she went back to work for the same exact employer. What if the owner pulled out the same exact contract that was signed years earlier, uh, brought it to her and said, you know what, I'd like to offer this again. I'd like to reaffirm this contract. I'd like to offer you the same wages, the same benefits, the same perks, and you'll have the same responsibilities, and we'll enter this contract together. That didn't happen, okay? It's hard to imagine that happening. But with being here at Nehemiah 8, it's very much similar to what's happening in Nehemiah 8 with Israel, right? God had made this covenant with Israel that they would be his covenant people, that they would be near him, that they would experience his blessings, his benefits, a relationship with God. And yet, and we see in Exodus 19, 5, when God originally made this covenant with Israel, after he called them out of slavery in Egypt, he says in Exodus 19, 5, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And in God's covenant, he had these provisions for sin. Like the people sinned, there were ways that he dealt with it by his grace. There was sacrifice. There was atonement that could be made within the covenant. And even with that... Israel started to jump into sin so much, and their hearts got so hardened, they no longer cared to do any of that anymore. They, they did nothing but serve idols, and they missed out. They, they were trying to use all of his blessings of being his covenant people without God. And this led to God handing them over to their sin, which takes them into captivity among foreign people. So the, Babylon, the Babylonians come in to take them. They take them out of the land that God has given them. And after years in a foreign land, apart from God, apart from the land, his people eventually cry out to the Lord. And what the Lord does is he welcomes them home. He brings them back. He answers their prayers. He brings them back. And, and again, he would be their God and they would be his people. And like a, like a property owner welcoming back an unfaithful manager, God here in Nehemiah 8 renews his covenant and he welcomes them home. The same relationship, the same promises, the same blessings. And because we see God's word drive everything that is done in this passage, it's a really good passage to look at to think about what is the role of God's word as we gather together as his people in corporate worship. And what we'll see this morning is that uh, God's word as we gather, it's read, it's preached, it's sung, it's prayed, it reveals God. It confronts our sin, and it directs our views to the good news of redemption. And um, so to begin with our first point, it's going to be God reveals himself through his word. As the words open and read, we, well, even before it's open and read, we see the scene of this passage opens with Israel seeking God at his word. They're not gathered in an attempt to make excuses. They're not there to justify their behavior. Rather, they throw themselves on the mercies of God. And they're gathered to listen to God. And they know just where to hear from him. Right away in verse 1, we see that the people tell Ezra to bring out the book of the law of Moses. And the text says that the word was brought forth and the people all stood. And this act says something about their view of the scriptures. Israel's not standing simply to honor a book. They're standing to honor God himself. They know that this book is like no other, that it's an extension of God himself. You know, as we see in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we've probably heard this verse so many times, and we should, because it says, it's what God's word says about itself. Listen, it says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 
The scriptures are breathed out by God. It's talking about, you know, as humans, when we speak, if you think about it, we are exhaling our breath and our vocal cords are moving in order to speak. And so he's using that picture to show this is God's word. It is coming from him. He speaks it. And so just as in a medieval movie, I, just, I don't know why this picture comes in my head, right? The, the, like, a, like a medieval movie, the, the, the king's men come out with trumpets and do 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 and they sound a king's messenger who comes out and rolls up a scroll and reads what the king has to decree. This is very similar to what's happening here, right? God's word is brought up. The king is going to speak. The people are standing. They're listening. They want to hear from him. And the king of the universe, he addresses his people through the reading of scriptures. And not only does Israel stand for the scriptures, it says God's word is in the front of all the people. It says it's in the center of all the people, and it's elevated, right? It says that they actually made a wooden platform just for the occasion. They wanted to put it up in the air. They wanted it to be special. They wanted it to be elevated. They wanted to show the importance. And so they did. The primary concern of these people who are gathered is hearing the God of the scriptures. And notice how the reading and teaching is not just a snippet of the service. Right? It's, it's the main event. It's read with an emphasis on clarity. The teachers explain what it means so that there is understanding. And there's a really good chance that the, when it says giving sense, that the, 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 the leaders gave sense to the text, um, it's a good chance that they're actually translating it for the younger generation. Because if you think about this, they were in captivity in Babylon, which the Assyrians eventually took over. There's a good chance a lot of them didn't even learn their native tongue. And so here it's being read to them in their native tongue. They may not understand it. People are walking around and translating it. And even if they're not translating it, and, and they're just simply clarifying it and explaining it um, and not translating it, this would be the third or fourth time in this passage where they're walking around making sure people understand God's word being read. So the primary concern of the leaders and the people was letting the scriptures speak and ensuring that everyone understood it. And the biblical pattern of preaching and teaching is reading and explaining the Bible. Here Ezra, the prophet, does it. Ezra, the prophet, the one who hears directly from God, is reading the Bible and explaining it, right? The apostles' teaching, as they go around and teach, they're not making up new stuff. The overwhelming majority of what the apostles did is they, they walk around uh, clarifying and teaching the Old Testament and how Christ came to fill it as the Messiah. Jesus himself, he's God in the flesh, the very word of God become man, he mostly taught the scriptures by reading and teaching and explaining it to the people in his life. If God reveals himself through the scriptures, then we must allow them to be heard and understood. And this is why Sunday gatherings are not only saturated with scripture, but they're built on scripture. We begin the service looking for God to speak through his word and a call to worship in scripture readings. And in our songs, we sing words that are either scripture or based on scripture, because these are the words that God reveals to us. Our prayers are filled with God's word as we seek to align our hearts with what he has declared to be true. Because we're not always there right away. Our preaching, just like we see in the text, focuses on reading, explaining, and calling people to obey God's word. And today, this is what theologians call expository preaching. And now we're going to put her up here. So these are just a couple of quotes. Um, so with what we're talking about today, theologians call this expository preaching, right? Reading the scriptures, explaining them, making them clear. Just a couple of quotes about that. Um, Mark Dever says, expositional preaching is preaching in which the main point of the biblical text is being considered uh, becomes the main point of the sermon being preached. And David Helm, another expositor, says, expositional preaching is empowered preaching that rightly submits the shape and emphasis of the sermon to the shape and emphasis of the biblical text. And simply put, um, expositional preaching is letting the Bible speak. And when the Bible speaks, God speaks to us. And this is the preaching method we see in Scripture. It's not new or cool. It, it doesn't require a preacher to be a Hollywood personality who can keep attention with funny jokes and feel-good stories. 
thankful for that. <laughs> it doesn't require video clips or smoke machines. It just requires that we open the Bible, we read it, we explain it, and urge people to obey it. It's nothing fancy. And when we do this, God powerfully transforms people's hearts. It's his power. It's not ours. It's not mine. It's not yours. Every time God's word is read, sung, prayed, preached, it's an opportunity to hear from God on a Sunday morning. And so I just want to ask, are you listening? Do you come to church Sunday expecting to hear from God? And I know we hear from God through the week. Every time we open up the scriptures, everyone, some, every time someone opens it with us uh, as we're meeting and talking, but the unique time on Sundays as we gather and open the word, are you expecting to hear from God? And this isn't a casual thing, right? It's not sitting down to watch a movie. It's not sitting down to watch 10-second clips on our phones, which rob, rob us of our attention spans, right? Um, it's coming together to hear the very words of the God of the universe, the God who made you, loves you, takes care of you every day. It's an opportunity to hear from him who's speaking through his word. And so what I want to do this morning is just urge us, me included, to turn from distractions on Sunday morning and to listen for God's word, to listen to what he's saying, right? Don't let things like little preferences get in the way of you hearing from God's word, because we can all be guilty of that. Well, that's not the way I would do it, so I'm not going to hear this. What a shame, right? Um, don't let distractions from home or work get in the way of hearing God's word on Sunday morning. Yes, there's laundry to be done. Yes, work will be there tomorrow. But this is a time to sit and be expecting to hear from God through his word. And we desperately need it. And when we hear it, it will change us. So as we gather and read the scriptures, God is in this place. And just think about this. God has graciously placed you in a church where God's word is being piped right into your ears five different ways every Sunday morning. Right? And that is a huge blessing. So we need to listen. We need to expect to hear that we are changed by his word. Uh, the second point that I see in this text, uh, something that's happening is God's word confronts our sinful heart. A great weakness of mine is the snooze button on my alarm. Right? I mean, especially this time. Well, not that bad this time of year, actually. But in the winter time, you know, who doesn't want extra time wrapped in their blankets in the quiet of a room where there are no other cares, it's quiet, and it just sounds too good to stay in bed, right? Um, I have to keep my alarm across the room, and if I don't, I, if I don't have to get up to shut it off, I'm not getting up. Um, each morning I have to be confronted by this alarm, which reminds me that there's something better to live for than sleep. And by the time I get up and walk across the floor and feel cold for a couple seconds, it's just enough to wake me up and remind me, okay, yeah, I need to get up. I need to get in the Word. I need to pray for my family and pray and uh, seek the Lord and get ready for work. Israel had gotten in trouble because they hit the snooze button, right? God had graciously given them an alarm of his word. It was confronting their sleepy hearts, and yet they stopped listening. And it's, it's as if they had gone behind hitting the snooze button and grabbing the alarm, thrown it across the wall so the alarm smashed, right? And they, it ceased to ring in their ears. And so they experienced the discipline of the word. And we know about that. They were off in exile. They were away from their homeland. They had lost everything. But here in Nehemiah 8, They've been brought back, and they desire to come under God's word. And here they are, graciously confronted by it. It says in verses 9 through 11 that the people wept, they mourned, and they grieved at the hearing of God's word. There's such a mess that the priests come up and they have to calm them like a, a mother calms a, a new baby, right? Um, scripture confronts our sin. Without hearing it, we'll view ourselves in every kind of way but the way that God. We so readily make ourselves the center of the universe, right? We make ourselves out to be primarily victims as our identity. Oh, poor me, you know? Um, we can also view ourselves as too far gone for God's grace. So I, my sin is way too wretched for God's grace. We can never love him. That's not true. We need to be confronted by God's grace in all those ways of thinking. Our hearts are weak. We are prone to wander. We're easily deceived. We're quick to place our trust in the shiny things we think are going to join it, you know, give us contentment and joy. They don't. We're bent toward worshiping ourselves, and we make idols out of just about anything. 
that God has given us his word like a mirror, and it shows who we are. And it doesn't show us who we are in comparison to the person sitting next to us in the pews or the row in front of the forest in the pews. It shows us who we are in light of God's character, his glory, his perfect love, his mercy, his power, his might, his patience, his love, all those things. And when we see ourselves in light of his glory, we realize we fall miserably short in comparison to him. And yet we were created to live for his glory. We were created to bear his image around the world, and we have fallen miserably short of his glory. And it should cut us to the heart when we see this. It should cause us to grieve how fall, how far we fall short of his glory. Right? Um, Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 talks about this, how the word of God is living and active. And I don't know if I have this on here. Yes. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. When, we, when I'm talking about this confronting by God's word, when I'm talking about um, how it should cut us to the heart, we shouldn't be walking around with miserable people, right? We'll get to the part in the end where they talk about rejoicing, but I just want to say that that part is coming. But we also should be a people who, when we see how, how our sin, you know, when we see our sin, when we see how far we are from God's glory, we should be cut to the heart. That should affect us. We should be brokenhearted for a time, right? But not always. As we see in Nehemiah 8, one of, one of the places God confronts us with his word is in corporate worship. And one thing I want you to see this morning is that everything that is done on Sunday mornings uh, is centered on God's word. Um, our, our whole gathering is laid out in a way that our wrong beliefs, values, and desires would be held up against God's word and graciously confronted by God's word. Starting with the call to worship when we start the service. Here's an example of just a random passage that could be used for a call to worship, but I want you to think about this for a second, okay? If you're like me, you don't just wake up in the morning praising God every day. Some mornings you wake up crabby. Some mornings you wake up sick. Some mornings you just wake up self-centered, okay? And sometimes you even get here sitting in the pews that way, right? Maybe the kids are just wearing on your last nerve and it's hard to get here. And you get here and you sit down. Right? And God has graciously given you this thing in a call to worship where his word is read and you're being called from a heart of selfishness, self-seeking, whatever it is, is being confronted that you would have a heart of worship and seeing God and rejoicing in his goodness. Right? You're being called from a place of maybe despair or brokenheartedness to joy and worship. And the one thing we have that can never be taken that's worthy, that's more worthy than anything. Right? And so you come into church and maybe you're just not feeling it. And you hear Psalm 9, 1 through 2, right? And you hear people reading it. It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. See how God's word confronts our hearts. It, it, it says right there that we ought to be thankful. And thankful for what? Thankful for all the wonderful deeds of the Lord. And you should hear that and you think, well, what wonderful deeds of the Lord? And your mind should all, there could be a list of a thousand things that we could think about there. So as you're confronted with that in your heart, and you're crabby, you hear those things, you should say, well, what should I be thankful for in the Lord? And then instantly you should be thinking, what about the breath in your lungs? I am thankful I'm breathing right now. What about new morning mercies? What about forgiveness of sin? What about new life in Christ? What about the power of Holy, the Holy Spirit in your life? the word of God at your fingertips every day, a family that's around you, and so many more wonderful deeds. It's all the credit to the Lord. All of them, right? And so when we read something like a call to worship, it's not just something to throw in there to buy time before we get to the rest of the service and the part you really like. It's there to confront your heart and prepare you to praise God and find joy in Him. By faith, we read his word, trusting he will move our hearts from distraction and self-centeredness to being enthralled with Jesus Christ. Don't hit the snooze button on God and God's word in corporate worship. Be present, be listening, and trust God to transform your heart by his word. 
The next thing I want to talk about, so that's just the call to worship in the service where his word is central. And if you think about it, we sing God's word as well. And we go from reading God's word to singing these beautiful truths to one another. Okay? Um, and maybe you come in in the morning and you're filled with despair and you feel like all hope has been lost. And you, and you come in in the morning. Here's just an example of a song by Sovereign Grace. Uh, come praise and glorify our God. Listen to these lyrics. And I think I have them up here. Yeah. Listen to these lyrics. So you come. Think about this, right? Everything in this life can be ripped away from us. And if we're trusting in our health, if we're trusting in our family, if we're trusting in our finances, whatever it is we have, all those things can be taken away. There's no promise of God that says it can't be. But there's one thing that cannot be taken away, and that is Christ. And that is worth rejoicing in. And so maybe you come in and you've lost a lot of things. And you're sad, and you feel hopeless, you can barely see in the fog of despair. And you come in, and God has graciously given you brothers and sisters next to you, singing the words like this to you. Think about this. Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us for for pure and blameless in his sight, he destined us to be, and now we've been adopted through his son eternally. On any given Sunday, we get to hear the saints singing to us. And it's God's word that's in the center of those things, and so it should wake our hearts and help us to see what we have in Christ, even if we have nothing else. And it should cause us to rejoice. Even on our worst day, we can rejoice in Christ. Perhaps you've recently fallen into sin and you've repented, you've confessed it, you've been reading the scriptures during the week, you've been praying, but you just don't have the feeling like God could forgive you. You maybe feel like God couldn't even look upon you. Listen to how the worship of the saints gloriously confronts you when singing, pure and blameless in his sight, he destined us to be. And now you've been adopted through his son eternally. Not only does that God declare you righteous, like in a courtroom where he's not holding these legal things against you anymore, he says, he comes off the bench as judge and he says, come home and live with me, son. Come home and live with me, daughter. He brings you into his family. That's something that we can praise God for, even if we struggle with sin, fall into temptation. So on Sunday mornings, the saints are singing, yes, primarily, first and foremost, to God. But they're singing to you, too. And I encourage you to listen, and I encourage you to belt it out, even if you sing like I do. Sing so the people next to you can hear, can be encouraged, can be confronted, and confronted by God's glory, that they would rejoice in Christ. And then to end our service, we usually have a benediction. And uh, I don't see this at this church. I've been at other churches where it seemed like that was just uh, background noise for people rushing off to brunch. Um, but here I love that people stay and they seem to really soak in uh, this time during the service when God's word and blessings are read over us. Um, but it's, a benediction is typically not just words that a pastor comes up with, right? It's not a prayer. It's an opportunity for God to speak to his people, specifically through blessings recorded in scripture. These are things that are ours as God's people, promises, blessings we have in him. Um, oftentimes, pastors will raise their hand as they read the benediction. And this is what Aaron did when he blessed God's people. It says, then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people and blessed them. Um, and it's what Jesus does too. In Luke 24, 50, it says, and Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted his hand, and he blessed them. And this blessing, um, one of the ones I'm most familiar with that is often read is number six. And it reminds us of the many promises God's people had then in the Old Covenant, but even more so in Christ today we have these blessings. Right? So I just want you to hear this blessing. Uh, it's a common one that's read at the end of service, and it's yours in Christ. Uh, number 6, 22 through 27. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Such blessings remind us that God is always with his people. He's for us, and there's much reason for hope. That hope shapes the, way we live, shapes the way we live our lives. 
And so God works powerfully through his word being read in the benediction to shape his people. It's a great time to soak in the blessings of God and to draw near to the almighty God who promises to strengthen his people. And we need God's word held up faithfully before us so that our wandering hearts are confronted by the one who is truly worthy to be worshipped. And then we turn from self-worship to delight in God. Now we're getting to that part, right? We don't, as, as God's people, we don't just walk around broken hearted all the time. Okay? It's a part of our walk because when we see God and we see how glorious he is, and when we, we love him so much, we see even more how much he loves us, it breaks our hearts when we go away from him. Right? And, and it should cut us to the heart. It should grieve us. But take a look at in this passage, when God's word is read, the people are cut to the heart. They're weeping, they're mourning, they're grieving how they've been so far from God. And God's message to them is, that's right, you better cry. In fact, you better not even look upon me or talk to me. Right? In Nehemiah 8, the people are cut to the heart because of God's word, but it ends with good news. Listen to this good news in verses 10 through 12. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to the Lord. If you don't notice there, this is celebrating. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites called all the people, saying, be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, and to send portions, and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. One of the cool things about that passage is when it says the joy of the Lord is your strength. It was meaning the fact that the Lord rejoices over them as his people made them strong. Right? There's nothing in them but the fact that even though they were sinful, God had set his affection on them, and it was their strength that he rejoiced over them as his people. <clears throat> The good news is that God doesn't simply confront us with his glory, leaving us to perish in our sin, but he makes us a way to bring us back to him. And in Nehemiah, God had acted in a mighty way to bring Israel back to himself, right? They had rebuilt the temple. They started teaching his word again. The walls were being constructed to protect them. The covenant was being proclaimed uh, to sinners that could draw near to God. And it's, it's really a beautiful moment in history, because God had done these things by his grace, by his mercy. They didn't deserve it at all. Again, they're the manager that were to manage God's place and took it all for themselves. And yes, they were disciplined, but God brought them back, and the contract or the covenant is brought out, and he says, okay, let's do this again. I'm going to do it the exact same way. I still love you. Okay? And that's a good reminder for us this morning, right? That even if you fail this week, if you're that person that, you know, maybe you got into some sin this week, you can repent and you can run toward Christ whose arms are wide open. He gives forgiveness to all who seek him. All who repent and believe in Christ are forgiven. And, all, and if you read the rest of the book of Nehemiah, it's pretty unexciting, right? All this work that's being done, right? The walls that are being built, they fall into disrepair. The word that's beautifully being proclaimed, the people stop listening to it again. They hit the snooze again. They didn't learn after being brought away for generations. And this all happens all over again. And if you get to the end of the book, you might be kind of feeling like, what's the point of this? Like, God did all these things for nothing? No, he didn't do all these things for nothing, right? It pointed to a prophet from among Israel greater than Moses who would come and speak for God and the people would listen. It, it pointed to new hearts that God would put in his people causing them to obey his laws. To one final sacrifice that would be sufficient because it would be God's only son put forth on our behalf. And it pointed to God coming to dwell not in a temple made with hands but to dwell among his people who would become his holy temple. It pointed to a protection not from a wall, but in the form of a seal of the Holy Spirit who would live in us, protecting us as his people. And what I'm talking about here is ultimately the good news of Jesus Christ, right? All of this is just shadows. The little glimpses of glory are amazing, but they really point forward to Jesus Christ, right? And it really paints a picture of this gospel message that we are all broken and sinful. We were made for God's glory. We were made to show his goodness in the world. And yet we've all said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to live my way. 
and is bankrupt, it separates us from God. And yet God came for us, right? And it's not even just a covenant, it's not even just through prophets, though he did, not even just through his word, but the word of God, the Son of God, Jesus himself, put on flesh. God came down from heaven to become one of us, to put on a body, to be born as a helpless little baby, to be cared for by his creation, to grow up experiencing everything we have. Right? And some of you are struggling with cold right now. Jesus had cold. He, know, he knew what it was like to feel that way. He identified with us in every way. He was tempted and yet never sinned. And this person, this God-man, right, because he was fully God, he was fully man, man, not man. His, his family said he was man, but he wasn't man. He was God and man. Though he was perfectly righteous, he was crucified. Though he never broke any laws, he was judged. And the scriptures say that on him was laid, or, or, or on him was laid the iniquity of us all. And so it was our sin that was laid on him on the cross. And he says, all who repent and believe the good news of the gospel will be brought near to God in relationship with God. And after he was crucified, he died, he was buried. But he didn't stay dead, right? He rose again, proving his power, proving the acceptance of his sacrifice. And he's up in heaven now, where he is king. And his call right now is for all to repent and believe the good news of the gospel. And as Christians, that's what we do every week, right? We keep the cross uh, before our eyes always in all things. And every breath and everything we read and every conversation, we want it to be about Jesus, right? And that's what we want to do as a church as well. Jesus is our only hope. And so we want to put Jesus before us in everything. We want to look to the gospel because... It's our only hope every day. And so, same thing on Sunday, you know, on Sundays and sermons and singing, we, we aren't going to just sing about, oh, this feels good, we're going to sing about Jesus and what he's done, because our hearts need to be confronted, our, our hearts need to be confronted with what Jesus has done, and the great hope and joy that there is in Christ, and his forgiveness, and being brought near to God, and it's only through Jesus. And so, we're here to treasure Jesus together. So again, we're a lot like the unfaithful property man, right? Um, all of us are. That's a, that I shared at the beginning of this message. But God's word speaks of a redeemer who came to save us and bring us back to him through the new covenant paid in Jesus' blood. God's word is to be at the center of our gatherings and at the center of our hearts. Our unbelief and wrong desires need to be confronted by God's word so we can see a better way and we desperately need to be reminded of the hope of the goodness of Jesus Christ. And so one final urging is, brothers and sisters, God is speaking and working through his word every Sunday when we gather. Are you listening? Are you being gloriously confronted by God and who he is in his good news? Are you being transformed into the image of Christ by his word? Let's pray. Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for your word, which points to your son. Lord, thank you that you are the kind of God who is full of mercy and grace. That though we have often been far from you and run from you, you run toward us and pursue sinners with you. Thank you for sending your son Jesus. Help us to consider this morning what that means for our lives. Help us to consider the call to repent or to turn from a life apart from Jesus and to run toward God and to believe that he is the Son of God, the Savior, the King of the universe. Uh, help us to trust him for all eternity. We pray this in his name.